Hi friends! Welcome to All By My Shelf. I'm Miss Rachel and it's so nice to see you. Today's panel is Presents from the Past. We were born to make history. Five historical fiction YA authors are here to talk to you all about why it's important for today's teens to read historical fiction. Our authors today are Hannah Alcalf, Abdi Nazemian, Cherie L. Smith, Amy Trueblood, and Kristen Lambert. If you're a Glenside patron, click the link marked Glenside. It'll take you to a sheet that lists all of the panelists' books that you're currently able to check out as ebooks. If you're more of a physical hard copy reader, don't worry. There's a form on there that you can fill out so that when the library is able to reopen, you are put on the hold list for a physical copy. I hope you enjoy this panel. to start off by asking all of our lovely authors um, to introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit about your most recent or upcoming book. Uh, I'm Cherie L. Smith and uh, my newest book is called The Blossom and the Firefly and um, it is a World War II love story um, set in Japan um, by the end of, uh, towards the end of the war, sorry, losing focus again, towards the end of the war in 1945, um, uh, kamikaze pilots in Japan were as young as 17. And this is a story of a 17 year old boy named Taro who wants to be a violinist but becomes a pilot and ends up um, being assigned a kamikaze mission. And a girl named Hana, who's a junior high school girl in the town where the air base is that he'll be flying his last mission from, and the junior high school girls were mobilized to work at the base and to serve the pilots their meals and make their beds. Um, and their last job was to line the runway and wave goodbye. And um, so this is a story that's set in eight days and tells what happens with the two of them. Um, hi, I'm Amy Trueblood and um, I write YA historical and my latest book is uh, Across the Broken Shore and it takes place in 1936 and crosses over until 1937 and it follows um, 1936 and 1937 San Francisco, I should say, and it follows the story of 18-year-old um, Willa McCarthy who is the only daughter in a big uh, Catholic family and it is the family role that the first female become a nun and she is sort of thinking that's going to be her life until um, one of her four brothers gets injured and she discovers that there's a female physician working in her neighborhood. So she um, starts to secretly mentor, not telling her parents, her family that she's mentoring with this doctor because she loves medicine and it ends up being that the doctor is taking care of the men building the Golden Gate Bridge. So it weaves Willa's story about how she follows her passion um, along with the building of the Golden Gate Bridge, which was really fun to do. And it's across the broken shore. I'll go. Um, hi, my name is Abdi Nazemian. My book is called Like a Love Story. Uh, it takes place in New York City in 1989 and 1990, and it's a story of um, three teenagers who become involved in AIDS activism, specifically with ACT UP. Um, the story kind of begins when an Iranian teenager moves to New York City with his mom, and he's very much in the closet because he's dealing with the shame of knowing he's gay in the Iranian culture, and then, um, of course, uh, the added fear of the fact that the AIDS epidemic was at its worst in the United States at that time, and he develops a relationship with Judy, an aspiring fashion designer, and her gay best friend, Art, 
Um, and kind of an added element is that Judy's uncle is um, a gay man living with AIDS and an ACT UP activist, and he becomes a mentor to all three of them. And so it's very much set against the real backdrop of the protests that were happening at the time. I'll go. <laughs> uh, my name is Hannah Alka, and um, my book, which I was not prepared enough to um, have here to hold up with me, so if Rachel, you would like to Photoshop something later on, here is my hand. Um, my book is called The Weight of Our Sky, and it came out in February of last year. Um, and it's set in 1969, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. And you follow 16-year-old Melati, who uh, you think is a um, typical teenage girl, until you realize that she has what we recognize to be debilitating OCD. Um, but it's 1969 and Mulati doesn't have the vocabulary for that. So she believes that she is being held hostage by a djinn who sends her these terrible images of her mother dying throughout the day unless she counts and taps according to a certain ritual. Um, but because I'm not a very nice person and I like my characters to suffer, I put her in the middle of the race riots of 13th May 1969 um, which occurred between the Malays and the Chinese, but sort of swept everyone up in this whirlwind of violence. Um, and I separated her from her mother. Um, and so it's the story of this girl throughout the week trying to make her way back to the one person she feels responsible for and that she feels she can't afford to lose. So, you know, your typical light beach read. Um, great for summer. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Rachel. This is, this is, is what my it looks book. Like. This is what it looks like. <laughs> Thank you. I'm very unprepared. It's 7.30 in the morning. I'm so sorry. It's totally <laughs> fine. I, to be fair, I didn't tell you to bring your book, so. I, I should know, but you know. Eh. Not, eh. Yeah. I have no book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hi, Kristen. <laughs> I don't have mine either. <laughs> it's sitting over there, but I can't okay. read. Hold on. I'll get it. <laughs> This is your uh, book. You wrote this. Oops. I totally did. Okay. I'm Kristen Lambert, and my debut young adult novel, The Boy in the Red Dress, comes out May 12th. And it's about a bisexual girl and her drag queen best friend teaming up to solve a mystery, a murder, in 1929 New Orleans. And it's about murder, but it's also fun. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, we love it. Um, so what were the first things that sort of drew you to the time and the place that you have chosen to set these books in? Um, was there something you were reading about? Um, did you already have some like history that you had learned about previously and you've always thought, wow, wouldn't it be interesting to dot dot dot? Um, what, what was that first sort of spark? I'll go. <laughs> um, I wanted to write about the 13th May incident because it's not a thing that we like to talk about very much in Malaysia. Um, for something that was so seminal uh, for us as a country, uh, we learn about it in about two paragraphs in our history textbook and only when we're about 16 or 17. So when we're about to be done with school is when we learn about it. Um, and we learn about in, in, in about two paragraphs, and then it's a page and a half of how great our government did in cleaning it up and making everything better. Um, and so we get a very sanitized version of events. Um, and I really, really don't like it when I'm fed a story and told to be happy with it. <laughs> um, I trained as a journalist for this precise reason, <laughs> because I, I want to know what the actual story is. Um, when you tell me something so important about our history in such a sanitized way, my first instinct is to question why you're telling it to me this way and what you're not telling me. Um, and I was worried that if I, in my 30s, already knew so little about this event that all the generations behind me would know even less. 
Um, and I know it, racism and mental illness, those are really uncomfortable things for probably a lot of different cultures, but particularly in Malaysia, those are really uncomfortable things for us to sit with. But I also felt very strongly that we needed to sit with that discomfort in order to learn anything from it. Um, and so that's why I wanted to write a 13th May story. People ask me this question a lot because it's not a fun part of our history to write about, but um, if nobody else writes about it, then where do the stories go? It's so wonderful, Hannah. <laughs> it was such a good book too. I can't resist, I have to say. <laughs> I'll jump in because mine kind of plays a little bit off of Hannah's and that's that I it's mine is not so much about a specific part in history mine is more about people in history um it really bothers me that there are so many phenomenal women in our history um not even only in the U.S. but in the world that sometimes seem to like only get one line in history books or they're forgotten all together and so I my first book my debut was called Nothing But Sky and it told the story of a 1920s um, wing walker, a female wing walker. And usually during that time in history, you heard all about the men aviators and the flying circuses and the barnstorming, but you never really heard about the women. Um, and so I happened upon this story about this um, woman who was a female wing walker, basically risked her life all the time. And when I went to go research her, she literally was again, like one line in Wikipedia about her. So um, it fired me up and I thought I really want to tell stories about women that are important to our history, but people don't recognize or people don't know automatically know their names. So Across the Broken Shore came from um, a funny story. Um, I just follow history and pictures on Twitter. And I was flipping through Twitter one day and I had just gotten a call from the managing editor and my, and my publisher. And she was like, so, what are you going to do for your follow-up book for us? And I was like, oh, yeah. So um, I was just flipping through Twitter, you know, wasting time trying to figure out what my next story was going to be. And this picture of this woman came up. Um, her name was Lucy Maria Wanzer, and she was the first woman west of the Rockies to get her medical degree. And a lot of people um, hear about Elizabeth um, uh, Black, I think it's Black first. Blackhurst or Blackbird, I can't remember, but she was actually the first woman in the U.S. to get her medical license, but this woman had the distinguished uh, characteristic of being the first woman in, on the west of the Rockies. So, but she's never talked about, never heard about, and she actually practiced in San Francisco for her entire life, um, and actually on the street where my character in the book, um, the female doctor in my book practices, Gary Street. And so um, I just thought, you know, I want to tell her story, um, but I wanted to tell it against the backdrop of the building of the bridge. And so what I did was I basically used the um, Dr. Wanzer character as kind of a mentor sort of figure for the female doctor in the book and um, kind of brought her to life in my head on the page and had her become the mentor for Grace. And by doing that, I was hoping to recognize not only what Dr. Wanzer had shown um, to the community and done for the community and the women and children, in uh, San Francisco, but it also I also nod to a couple of other females who practiced in San Francisco at the time. So I kind of take fiction and then I try to read real historical characters and things into it because again, I feel it's really, really important to tell these women's stories um, who again, don't really get recognized in our history books. I'll jump in since we're talking about women. <laughs> um, I think it's Elizabeth Blackwell, Dr. Elizabeth Blackwell. Blackwell, Blackwell. thank you, yes, is, thank is you. who you're talking about. Yep. Um, yeah, so for me, I've written World War II um, uh, several times before. I wrote, I wrote, let's see, I wrote this little book. Fly Girl. Um, well, I wrote Fly Girl. So, okay, I don't have a copy of Fly Girl within hands reach. <laughs> I love that book. <laughs> I, I, well, actually, I lied. Okay, so Fly Girl. I wrote Fly Girl, which is, thank you. So World War II Women's Air Force Service Pilots, and then... On the strength of that book, as I lose focus again, on the strength of that book, I wrote, um, I got the chance to write this little book, which is out of focus too, but um, who were the Tuskegee Airmen? And um, I think it was while I was researching that, and my publisher had said, hey, we'd love another um, historical fiction from you because I write um, all sorts of genres and I had just done like, fantasy and, and a mystery. And um, 
I came across this photograph of these Japanese schoolgirls in their little midi blouses, you know, they're like little sailor uniforms, but work pants, and they were carrying armloads of cherry blossoms and waving at an airplane taking off, a fighter plane. And this old black and white photo, I was like, what the heck's going on there? And the article was about a, um, a kamikaze peace museum in this little town in southern Japan called Chidan. And, um, and that's when I read, about, I, I started looking into it, trying to figure it out. And that's when I learned that some of these pilots were so young. And, um, and that's not part of the history that we're taught here. Like kamikaze in America is either like, now it's like a radical thing to be, or it's a drink, or it's like, you know, balls to the wall, I'm, I'm going crazy. And um, it's just got this deeper, really sad, painful history um, that moved me. And I wanted to know in, in you know, in the past 10, 15 years, we've seen a resurgence of like suicide bombers and death by cop and things like that. And you wonder what drives somebody to do this? What makes them willing to do it? What sort of indoctrination? So I decided to try to find out. And I went to Japan and I visited the museum and I visited the, the, the former air base and some other things and um, really try to tell the story. So the story for Hana is set in those eight days because um, the local junior high school girls worked at the air base. And then for Taro, the boy, we start in infancy so that you can follow the um, upbringing that leads him to that point. And it was really um, a combination of an act of empathy and curiosity. I can, I can go ahead. I mean, I guess for me, the, um, the inspiration behind writing this book was very personal. Um, I, I am a gay man, I'm Iranian, I, you know, first became a conscious being when AIDS was already at its worst and it pretty much remained um, at its worst throughout all of my childhood and teenage years. So I didn't really remember a time um, that I, you know, was human and that this wasn't kind of ravaging the community that I knew I would eventually be a part of. Um, and I always wanted to write a story that was about my generation and how we coped with the AIDS epidemic because I felt like with very good reason, the majority of the storytelling is about the generation that was on the front lines since they were the ones who were most affected and who were fighting. Um, but I felt like there was a story to tell in kids who were too young to be losing all of their friends, but who were coming into their sexuality at a time when they were being told that their sexuality was synonymous with death and what that does to you. And how do you fall in love when you're told that falling in love is, is going to kill you? Um, and, and ultimately it is a love story. Um, and that's, that's what was so exciting to me. I don't, um, I don't know what my books are gonna be about when I start writing them other than like, I knew I wanted to tell the story of, of this generation. And I knew I wanted it to center on an immigrant because that for me was such a, you know, important part of it too, that for the most part, a lot of the storytelling around the AIDS epidemic was around white, men and I felt like I wanted a story that told um, a queer narrative that centered on an immigrant. But, um, but I was very, I guess, pleasantly surprised that, that as I wrote the book, it became much more hopeful than I thought it would be because I was coming from such a place of anger and, and shame. Um, and as I was writing it, I realized how much love there was, um, how much community and you know in a way I feel like the book is this love letter to everything that allowed me to have the life I have now and that's you know activists, artists, friends, mentors and so it became I think this um, much more connected and hopeful story than than I thought it would be going in and, and I do think given the time we're living through right now it you know sometimes I think back to this book and I'm reminded okay there is connection there is hope you know um, and mine is kind of related to that because mine is set at the end of the 20s and the beginning of the 30s, like literally New Year's Eve, 1929. <laughs> and so um, the teens and 20s had been gradually getting more liberal um, 
people are getting more open-minded, you know, 20s version of open-minded. It's not the same as now, but it reminds me of how things have been going the past couple of, you know, things were getting better. And then there's this conservative backlash that happened in the 30s. And I mean, it's kind of reminds me of today, but I'm hoping that time that, um, it won't be totally like that, that we won't have to have generations of um, going backward, that now people will stand up for each other more, I hope. Um, but also one thing that was important to me about writing about the past and was to show, once I read all these stories about the queer experience in the past, I wanted kids to see that it's always we've always been here and um, that we've always found a way to find community and find a family, even when like you're told or certain, I live in Alabama. So um, you hear a lot of people talking about how it's just trendy now to be various types of queer and, and, I wanted kids to read this and see, no, it isn't a trend. It's been, people have been all sorts of kinds of queer forever. And I just wanted them to see it. So that's why I wrote about what I did. So sort of going off of that, if this was later down in my list of questions, but we sort of already touched on it. Um, why do you think it is important for today's teens to read fiction about the past? I, I guess I can start. Um, I mean, I think building a little bit on what Hannah was already saying, I think a lot of history is not taught to teens. I know that when it comes to queer history, it's not. Um, I am both moved and shocked when I hear from teenagers who tell me they knew next to nothing about the AIDS epidemic and what it did when they read this book, because to me, it's the most important piece of my lifetime's history and it I don't understand how um it's not being taught in schools and I think even in the reactions to this book I know that a lot of educators um they pause when they have to acknowledge queer sexuality and they don't know how to incorporate that into classrooms and so I think a lot of times we are writing these books because we want to fill in the gaps of the educational system um, around the world. And, you know, I would also say, I know for me, like on a very personal level, I'm, you know, the two pieces of my identity that matter the most to me are being Iranian and being gay. And in both cases, that history was shielded from me as a kid. Like my parents left because of the revolution. And I think, you know, in order to uh, kind of save me from the trauma, they didn't tell me a lot about what happened um, before we left. And so, I had a lot of questions and similarly, you know, because I came from a relatively conservative Iranian background, I wasn't exposed to queer history. And so I feel like for a lot of my life, I felt very ruthless and, you know, didn't know how to find my own identity. And I think, you know, young people need to know that they came from something and need to kind of build a line um, from them to the past, I think, in order to feel safe. And so, I don't know. I, know, I know that that was very important to me and I hope that's important to other kids. And I know that as teens read you know, my book and all of these books, they, they see themselves in them. And, and sometimes that's, that's very sad because like you know, what this book is about with an epidemic and a government that <laughs> you know, was not paying attention to it and causing people's deaths. And, you know, it's, it's almost, I, I don't even want to bring up his, he shall not be named. But um, I, I think there's also something important about that because you realize you weren't the first, you weren't the last, and there are guides out there, you know? Um, I'm going to jump in off of there um, because I think it's somewhat related, but on top of everything that Abdi's already said so well. Um, I also think that humans are just wired for story. 
um, and that we remember things better when they touch us in some way, when they affect us emotionally in some way. And so what I was finding was that a lot of teens who went through the Malaysian school system and learned about the 13th May riots um, didn't remember very much about them because they were only studying them um, <laughs> to, to use in exams or to answer questions that their teacher asked. And they don't, it doesn't stick with them. It doesn't stay with them. They don't, they don't remember anything after they're done with that class or they're done with that test or whatever. Um, and so I just thought it was really important and I still think it's important that these stories that we write um, come in the form of stories, because I think that's how we remember things. And I think that's how things stick with us. Um, and I think that's why it's important to write fiction that deals with the past. I do think uh, it, it's definitely, um, it's a trope, but true that history repeats itself every 30 years. And if you don't learn it, you're doomed to repeat the same mistakes. And um, for me, like I tend to write World War II, World War II aviation. There are a lot of hidden stories, um, especially stories of, of non-white people. There's a lot of hidden history that deserves to come to light. And, um, and some of that is heroes and some of that is wounds and they can't heal or be celebrated or serve as role models um, if they stay hidden. But um, beyond that, I think, um, you know, we're, I'm watching a lot of um, our greatest generation in World War II um, veterans are passing away. We're losing our history and there is this sort of I don't know, the, the evil nothing on the edge of, of the world that is waiting to, um, to erase the truth and waiting to deny, you know, there are people who deny things now and it's like, wow, we're 75 years out from one of the biggest catastrophes, a man-made catastrophe in living history and people are already saying and have been for years saying, oh, that didn't happen. Oh, that's not true. And um, we can't build on lies. We have to remember the, the past, remember the truth. And Abdi, what, what you said about kids um, not knowing, not knowing about things that were in our lifetime and, and you know, and we're young, <laughs> relatively speaking. So it's appalling to me that, um, you know, I get it when somebody's like, oh, I never heard about that obscure piece of World War II history, or I never heard about that thing. But when you're like, well, I never heard about, you know, a, a massive epidemic that, that significantly altered the way we live our lives. The way we live our lives, you know, um, is, is astonishing to me. And it makes me wonder, you know, in another 20, 30 years, what will people say about now? What will people say about, I mean, we already see narratives on 9-11 are starting to fracture in their kids. I've got a niece who was born on September 11th, 10 years after 9-11, and she one day was like, so what happened? What was it all about? And I was like, how do you not know? And then why did you choose me to tell you instead of your parents? And your parents were at the other end of the table, and they were just like, you can tell her. And I, and you know, and she's like, I know the broad strokes, but I, so I explained it to her. And, um, you know, that it, it just, I think people are afraid to explain hard truths. And then people don't remember them and don't learn them and ignore them. And like, this is a panel of really brave people who are willing to step up. And, you know, um, I'm glad to be with you guys today, quite frankly. Ditto. I want us to, to jump on that if we don't remember history we're bound to repeat it type of thing and when I was in um, first revisions for across the broken shore was when we were starting to have all the issues with the borders and all the horrible things that came after that um, travel bans and all that kind of stuff and a big part of my story um, touches upon um, the Great Depression and the shanty towns and a lot of that comes from immigrants and there's a part in the book where um, the little boy in the story is trying to explain their <clears throat> his traveling over from Ireland with his family 
and his, and them getting off the boat on San Francisco and just how awful people were to them. And um, it touches upon my book, Tenses Upon the Shantytown kind of environment too. And a lot of people say, you know, why did you include that? Why was that important? And for me, it was huge because I wanted kids who would be reading this book to see that we kind of hem and haw about how far we've come, but when we get down to the brass tacks of things, we haven't really come that far. And I want to show them that, you know, this happened, you know, close to 100 years ago, it's still happening now. But, you know, there's, there's always a time and there's always a voice and maybe this will be the generation that will speak up and make it stop. And so for me, the immigration part of my book was so huge and it was so important to me um, that it really come through in revisions and in edits because I felt like people who are reading this book, specifically the teen audience, again, needed to see that, you know, um, that this is something that's been perpetuated for way too long and that hopefully they would be the ones or they will be the ones that will rise up and make an end. Can I, can I jump in and add something? Are we allowed to do yeah. that? No. <laughs> I mean, one thing, I just, first of all, I got very emotional as you guys were all speaking and it is very, I don't know. It's, it's, it's reminding me of how, I mean, I'm lucky to have a family, but it's reminding me that I haven't had a lot of interaction. <laughs> the last month um but one thing that really stuck with me this idea of history repeating itself and i think hearing about all these books it just reminded me of it is something that really drove me when i was writing this book is this idea that like we talk about history repeating itself as it's a bad thing but if we tell the right stories then the good parts of history can repeat themselves you know the heroism the activism i think so much about act up right now and how they can be a guide as to how to deal with you know the current governments of the United States and of many other countries who are screwing it up. But, but I think that's so important is, is, you know, we do shield people from trauma a lot of the time, but it's like, it, the stories don't always have to be traumatic. We can lay out the ways that people succeeded um, through storytelling. And I think that that's very important. Um, okay. So, um, with historical fiction, obviously there's a lot of research because, um, to the best of my knowledge, none of you are time travelers and none of you are immortal. Um, so to tell you if we were, though, <laughs> that's why I said to the best of my knowledge, like I didn't rule it out as a possibility. I'm just saying if you are, I don't know about it. So I definitely really contend that we are time traveling right now, but only one direction <laughs> and very slowly. That's true. <laughs> That is true. Um, so since if you are either of those things, I do not know about it. I assume that you've done research um, to talk about the time periods that you are writing in. So what is that process like for you? Um, do you do a lot of your research before you start writing um, and then sort of just use what you've learned as you go? Um, do you start with the idea and you go, oh yeah, I'm going to write about this. And then you sort of like write all of it and then you go back and fact check, or do you sort of pop back and forth between the two things? I'll go since I skipped the last one. Um, I go back and forth a lot. I usually read a lot of nonfiction books before I get started kind of, and it gets me properly obsessed with the subject and the time period. But then once I start writing, I finally learned to put in little little notes to myself, insert color of movie theater seat later, or insert street name later, or I will spend like two days researching this tiny piece of information that then later gets cut entirely. And that happened to me a lot of times, so I finally got smart-ish and, um, started putting little notes to myself so that I don't have full-on research tangents but research is really fun it's my favorite I think the giving notes to yourself is a really good idea because I will go down that rabbit hole too and it seems so important mm -hmm. <laughs> and you know it's not at all but for me it varies from book to book um but I try to do some preliminary research um I make the outline of the story that I think I want to tell or the story I think it's going to be and then I do some research and then I revisit that outline and uh, and then I start writing and, and with with the blossom and the firefly 
I planned a trip to Japan, but I had like a really small amount of time I could go and I had limited funds to do it. And so I decided to write the book before I went so that I would know what was missing. And then I could focus on getting that information. So I did a bunch of, of book research and internet research and um, wrote my, you know, sort of a quick and dirty draft and then made a list of details and things I'd like and then things to fact check. And then I went to Japan and um, um, ran around for a few days gr grabbing everything I could get. I have all these books in Japanese that I can't read. Um, but like I'll sit there with like my iPhone going translate and, um, uh, and, and it was useful. It was really useful. I came back and, and revised and plumped up and added. I took uh, some Japanese lessons um, before I went to Japan so that I could at least be polite to people. And, um, and I worked with a, uh, my, I had a guide and translator with me who was amazing um, and so excited because she's like, oh, you're a real author. Like I've never worked with an author before. So she went out and bought books so that she would know more to help me. And that was incredible. And I just I actually, when the book came out, I sent her a copy and, uh, and she got it on her birthday and was like, thank you. This is so well researched. I'm going to use it on my, on my, um, with my tour groups now, which was insane and like the best compliment ever. So, but I think the short version of that is beginning, middle and end. You just keep researching. At least I do. Can I jump in for a second? Cause I want to play off of what, um, what Cherie just said, um, that I did the sign of the same thing. I, I knew that this book couldn't be right unless I actually went to San Francisco and walked the bridge and did everything. So I um, planned a trip and actually walked from tower to tower um, all the way back and forth across the bridge. And uh, my poor family, <laughs> I stopped every five minutes and took a picture of everything. Um, of all the towers, of all the metal rivets, I mean, everything, we just kept going. And my family was really mad at me too because it happened to be a San Francisco day that had like wind gusts of up like to 50 and 60 miles an hour. So walking across the bridge with wind gusts like that is not fun. Um, and the car is whipping back and forth. But I knew if I was gonna write this story, I had to actually get my feet on the bridge and have a sense of what it would be like for those men to be standing there, you know, you know, 200 feet above the water in this whipping wind. A lot of times it was foggy, it was wet. So I wanted to really feel like what that was like. It was really important to me. I'm a really visceral, visceral writer. So I wanted to know what it felt like to have the wind, you know, whipping across my face, my hair and my eyes, you know, what it felt underneath my feet. Um, so that was really important. But um, I also was really lucky in the fact that I had help too. Um, I actually worked with a San Francisco historian um, by the name of John Freeman. And he just basically set me straight. Like He read two drafts of my book. He I was born and raised in the Richmond district, which is the setting for my book. And so he just really, you know, was like, oh, this doesn't work. Nope, you're going the wrong direction when she's walking down the street. So he really kept me on the straight and narrow. So what I did is I did my trip first and I kind of talked through the book with John at first. Um, I met him in his house actually in the Richmond district, a house that could have easily been um, Willa's house um, uh, or been, been like Willa's apartment. And, um, and we, I planned to talk to him for an hour. We talked for three hours and um, even then I didn't want to leave. He actually gave me an old, old book, um, an old book of like, it was actually a tome that the city of San Francisco put together that was done by the architects. And they actually put this huge book together that they presented to the city council when the bridge was done. It said, this is every day, every piece of work we did on the bridge every day. I mean, it was like a piece of history I would have never been able to get on my own. But back to <laughs> my tangent, back to the original question, which was, I knew I had to have an understanding of the bridge and walk the bridge and feel it first before I could even write it. And then once I had a feeling of what that was going to be like, I went to the museum store and I bought like every book known to man that they had, as you can tell, like see all the things. Um, and then I just went, went back home and I just wrote the first draft and I tried to stop where I remember details. And then I went back to all my history and kind of just filled in along the way. Um, I think for me, for every historical story I write, my approach is different just because I have a different feeling. 
Um, so for this book, I knew it had to be just kind of, I had to understand the feeling of the bridge before I really started writing anything. And having that understanding and knowing my own just terror of standing up there, I can't even imagine being 200 feet above the ground and trying to build those towers. So for me, that really helped me tell the story. And that's really the important part of research for this book. All right, Abdi, I'm unmuting first, so I'm going to take it. <laughs> I can see you. I can see you being like, oh, no, which one of us is going to do it? Which one of us is going to do it? I'm, I, I hit unmute first. Um, I went to school for journalism, so I approached this very much as if I was writing a long-form feature <laughs> and that I needed to do research for. Um, the thing about writing about 13th of May 1969 is that I, I live here. <laughs> I live here and it's my history and um, when you think about it 1969 isn't that long ago. Last year was actually the 50th anniversary of the 13th May riots. So this is a part of history that isn't very far from us um, and so one of the things that was really important to me was first of all the first step is always for me just reading everything that you can find about it right. Um, and that included, you know, not just history books, but also biographies of people who had lived through that time, anything that could give you a little more color and detail into what life was like. But it was also really important to me to go straight to the source and to go to people who had actually lived through the riots, um, who had actually been there and seen things or were adjacent to it. Like if you were a kid who lived through that, right? What was that like for you? What was the ex experience like for you watching the adults go through that? What kind of you know, food shortages, what kind of things were you eating? What memories do you have of this time? Um, and so I conducted a lot of interviews, um, which by the way, part of writing about a really sensitive subject in your country is finding people to interview. Not that easy, um, but I did manage to find a good number of people to interview. Um, and that was, that served as sort of the primary source of the 13th May riots themselves. But I think for all of us, um, it's probably the same thing where people talk about world building as if it's exclusively the realm of fantasy. But I think when you write historical, it's just as important to think about your world building because any jarring small detail in the background that doesn't belong there takes the reader out of the story immediately. And so part of it is really just figuring out what Kuala Lumpur as an entity was like in 1969, what the smells would have been like, what the sounds would have been like, what, what sights you would have seen and all these things. And you don't want to sound like a tour guide being like, and this building was on the right, and this building was on the left. Like, there's nothing authentic about that. Um, so there's a whole other level to just building the city as it was and building the environment around you as it was. Um, and then for me, there was another level as well of researching mental illness in, 19, in the 1960s in Malaysia, which is a very specific thing, um, and, and how the Muslim community would have, would have treated mental illness at the time, um, because my main character is Muslim, like me. Um, and so there's just all these different layers. And I have to start with a base before I can even begin writing the book, because I have to feel like I have some sort of footing in the story before I can even begin writing. But I think with historical, as I think everybody has mentioned, um, research is sort of an ongoing process because as you write, you'll uncover more things where you're like, you know, if I get this wrong, somebody on the internet is going to be like, lady, you got this wrong. Um, which is how I found myself at 1 a.m. comparing a 60s map of Kuala Lumpur to Google Maps and trying to figure out whether a 12 minute walking time was was uh, more accurate than a seven minute, as if anybody was going to be like, honey, you got this wrong. This walk only takes seven minutes. This whole book is not valid anymore. Um, but that's how I found myself there. <laughs> I was trying to get all the details exactly right. Um, but yeah, and I also felt a certain sense of responsibility for that because these are things people actually lived through. And I didn't want to disrespect anybody's memories, particularly those who had been kind enough to open those old wounds and share their stories with me. And so I felt like I had to treat this whole thing with a lot of respect and get it as right as I could. So, okay, Abdi, now you yeah, go. I would, I've unmuted. Um, 
Yeah, I actually think what you said, the part about the respect was so important to me too. I felt like, you know, the activists of ACT UP are a lot of the reason that I'm here today and have been able to have the life I have. And so, you know, I wanted to write a story that was fiction, but I knew that I had to get that aspect of it very right. Um, and so that's really what I spent the majority of my time researching because so much of the rest of it was inspired by my own childhood. I felt like you know, research was was sense memory in a way, um, but I was not in ACT UP. And um, once I made this discovery, the book is kind of told in three sections. Um, you know, one section is in September of 89, one in December of 89, and then one in May and June of 1990. And once I came up with the idea that each, you know, kind of section of the novel would be built around one of ACT UP's protests, um, I realized that I was going to have to do a lot of work to make sure that I, you know, described those protests in a way that respected um, the people who were actually behind them. Um, I mean, one decision I made, which was a very difficult decision, is I decided not to have real um, historical figures in the novel speaking. I mean, they're, they're sometimes referred to, but I felt like in the context of this novel, at least. I've seen it done very well in other novels, but I felt like in the context of this novel to have someone like Larry Kramer interacting with these fictional characters would almost like, I was like, I'm not gonna put fictional words in the mouths of activists, many of whom are still with us, um, who are heroes of mine. So I, I made a decision not to do that. Um, I think the really tricky thing, which I think you, referred to as well is, is like you do all this research and for me it was ongoing as well um, but you do all this research and then you can't you have to layer the research in organically into the narrative like you can't be just like showing off your research because then you know the book doesn't feel alive and the book does feel like a historical textbook and the whole point of storytelling is to to get people to escape into the the narrative. So I think that that's this really tricky thing. And I think especially when you're writing young adults, you know, there's this ongoing discussion often with your editor about like, well, how much do you have to explain about um, such and such thing? Because I mean, my book is littered with references to, you know, culture and everything from musicians to politicians. And it's like, well, how much do you have to tell people? Or do you just trust that they're going to go and Google, you know, Jesse Helms and Cindy Lauper or whatever? Um, but, and I think another thing is, you know, as much as you can, I mean, some of, you know, Sheree and Amy, you guys traveled, which is amazing. I lived in New York City and my parents still do. So I have that, I had that, but I did think it was very important for me to find um, ACT UP activists. And I did, I was lucky enough to have two, two who read the book um, and gave me really, really useful feedback. Because as much as you can find stuff through books and documentaries and news articles, you know, oftentimes, it is going to be the person who lived the experience um, who will give you notes. And I will say one really funny thing, like I was so, um, I was just adamant about not changing facts about these ACT UP protests. But one thing that I did change in my book is I changed the, the book, the title is inspired by Madonna and she plays a very big role in the book, inspiring the teens. And I really wanted the, kid, the, the teens in my novel to attend the Blonde Ambition Tour, which was happening at the same time as this novel takes place. And so I fudged the date of the Blonde Ambition Tour in Landover, Maryland, so that they could attend while they were going to a protest. That was the only thing I fudged. And I gave the book to this, this incredible ACT UP activist who has, you know, who has remained active and he made a documentary about ACT UP. And he sent me all of these notes and he was like, you know, this is really like impressively researched. Like I don't have that many mistakes and he's like, but the Madonna Blonde Ambition Tour did not happen on this day. <laughs> and it literally, I fudged it by like 10 days, by the way. And I just thought that was so incredible that he caught that mistake. But it just goes to show you, people will call you out, you know? Yeah. And if you're gonna change an element of history, you have to be able to stand behind it. Like I was, I made peace with the fact that I changed the date of a Madonna tour, but there's other things I would never have changed. I just wanted to add that um, I also had a subscription to the uh, newspapers from the past from New Orleans. I was constantly going and reading what people really said at the time and people's lingo they used. And also the newspapers were terrible, by the way. <laughs> 
Like they were full of just racist stuff and I mean, they're awful. So anyway, the twenties were terrible. Don't go there if you get a time machine. <laughs> but my version of it, like I wanted to have the accuracy like you're talking about, but I also wanted it to more than I wanted um, every little color of the movie theater seat cushions to be right, even though I really wanted that to be right. I wanted it to feel right. But I also wanted it to feel non-horrible. And the past is pretty horrible. So, <laughs> But I wanted, because it's for teens, and because I wanted this to be a book that was was um, like a welcoming kind of a book and uh, uh, gave, gave people a good feeling, then I, um, it, what I said about it being, I think it was you that said about it being a fantasy, maybe, <laughs> uh, about um, fantasy and historical fiction being very similar about the world building, mm -hmm. that um, I really wanted this world to be a world that people wanted to be in. <laughs> And um, so I gave myself a little bit of liberty to make it a little tiny bit less horrible than reality. So that was my one concession to uh, modern tastes is non-horrible. Just to jump in, I think something that we all sort of touched on a little bit but didn't really expand on was the importance of having really good readers um, and I don't want to call them sensitivity readers, um, but readers to check on check you for authenticity, basically. Um, and I think that's a really important step. Um, it is surprisingly difficult to find someone who lives in the intersection of Muslim and OCD, but I did manage to find someone. <laughs> um, so I just think uh, that's not a step that should be taken lightly as well to, to get readers who can check you on your mistakes before they become too big for you to control. Mm -hmm. um, that's a really important step to take. You know, I, I, I want to add, add to that too, because I was writing outside of my culture and outside of my time period. And, um, you know, I, 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 I was not a working journalist, but I do have a, a journalism degree. And I, you know, really, my mom was a research librarian, like I, like, I've been taught to make sure I do my, you know, do my due diligence. But when it came to finding someone to read it, like you also don't want to make the mistake of thinking that one person is representative of an entire people or situation. And so um, I actually had a friend who um, is half Japanese and writes World War II. Um, take a look at it because she could look at it from a historical perspective and not just, um, you know, just a cultural or, and, and um, you know, I, I worried about getting that right. Like I felt like I could fudge like a World War II, a white World War II soldier, but what are you gonna do about a Japanese guy? What is machismo in Japan in World War II? And so I relied heavily on, on diary entries and letters from, um, soldiers and people that lived in the time period. But then we also had a native Japanese speaker look at the use of language because there's so many different forms um, from formal to informal for even names for mother and things like that. And I am eternally grateful that, that uh, we managed to do that because there's definitely things that I would have gotten wrong um, if, if I hadn't. And knowing that you've done your best and can sort of back it up, I think Abdi, you had said something about that. Like if you're gonna change something, you need to be able to stand by your changes. Like that, that certainly can um, give you the confidence to do that um, uh, without having to just BS your way. <laughs> then go, oh, well, I did my best. Or it's fiction. Like that's never an excuse, I think. Okay, so we're getting close to being short on time uh, and I don't want to keep you guys from your lives. Um, so short answers for these two. Um, was there anything that you found while researching the books that you've been talking about um, that you found really interesting but didn't fit into the book for whatever reason? I 
I did, but I'm saving it for future books. That's fair. <laughs> well, I'll, ju I'll just say that because I, um, because I made a decision not to include a lot of the real people in the narrative, in the author's note, I, I include quite a long list of books, authors, documentaries, and what I really hope is that people use it. It's not so much the stuff that I need to write about, it's that I hope people get inspired to do further research into the AIDS epidemic and ACT UP and, and what was happening. I'll just say really quick that one of the things that, as I did my research, really struck me was the Golden Gate Bridge was the first bridge built that had any real safety features included men being tethered into lines and um, there was actually a whole big thing about lead poisoning the men that were inside the towers they were painting them and then they were drilling the rivet so a bunch of men got lead poisoning and their hair fell out and their teeth fell out there was all this really interesting stuff that it would have been great to kind of include all those details um, but I kind of really held back and only kind of included this the safety things that I thought were would work for the story. But the one thing that I really wanted to include, but I couldn't because it didn't work for my time frame. My, my book straddles, starts at like October of 36 and goes into May of 37. But in 1935, when they were still building the bridge, there was an earthquake. So the men who were actually on the towers while the whole entire bridge was shaking. And that, that whole thing just fascinated me and terrified me. And I thought, is there any way I can work this in and play with that? And of course, time-wise it didn't work, but that was one of the things where I was like, oh my God, that would just be an amazing thing to write, but it's not historically accurate. So, but um, the bridge and the safety stuff it, it, I got to include, which was really fun. Yeah. Um, so are there any time periods that y'all would like to write about that you have not yet gotten a chance to write about? Or are you working on something that you are writing in a different time period already? I am working on a middle grade novel set during 1986 in Kuala Lumpur, um, which is when there was a massive operation by the government, um, apparently in the name of keeping the peace and making sure racial sentiment wasn't stirred, but was actually just an excuse to lock up a bunch of activists and politicians on the other side of the divide um, under our Internal Security Act. So, yet another fun read from Hannah. Look out for it. Um, yeah, but uh, 1986. So, for um, middle grade readers, that's going to be yeah. ancient history. Speaking of middle middle grade, um, do, you, do you have another? That was very smooth. That was a very smooth segue, Rachel. Book coming out? I do. I do have another book coming out, and it is a middle grade. Um, I actually have two things coming out. Um, in May, I'm part of Once Upon an Eid, which is a middle grade anthology from Abrams about the hope and joy of our celebration, Eid. And in August, I have a middle grade ghost story coming out from HarperCollins called The Girl and the Ghost, which is about what happens when a little girl inherits a ghost from a grandmother she's never met and um, what she does with that. So, yes. Uh, I'll jump in. Um, a, yes, that totally sounds adorable. And Hannah, don't ever stop fighting the good fight because, like, I love your fire and it's necessary. Um, I, I would, I actually think I would like to write the 20s, um, something in the 20s, but I have no idea what that story is. So that's not going to happen right now. I have, you know, I have one of those things that the stories you write on legal pads that you never really pay much attention to. That is like a 1930s mystery that one day maybe I'll get serious about it. But um, I'm, I'm starting to do research on a couple of uh, nonfiction projects that are um, 1930s to 1940s. Uh, uh, um, so um, one's an aviation thing and, and one is uh, dancing. And oh, and then actually, maybe I actually do get to do the 20s nonfiction. It's going to be. Um, what was the Harlem Renaissance? I'm just cracking open the books on that, so I'm super excited about that. I'll jump in. Um, I have a story in the back of my head. I have two other books <laughs> that my agent already wants, but I have a story that would be the day, the days following um, the Titanic. 
and what happens to one of the survivors. So um, there's tons of Titanic books, so I, I, I'm really hesitant about this, but it's one of those stories that's kind of lodged in the back of my head that keeps gnawing and saying it needs to be written. So um, I have several other <laughs> books that are due before that, but um, it's definitely something that I may play with, but I'm not sure yet. But it's if you have one of those ideas, I'm sure all of you know those ideas that are in the back of your head that are like, I need to be written, write me, write me. So I'm I'm gonna play with that maybe one day soon. We'll see. I have one I really want to write that is set in 1918 in New Orleans. And I've done a lot of research on it, but I can't ever quite make it come together. But maybe one of these days I can. Yeah, I'm, I'm working on something that would take place in the year 2000, which, you know, when they told me 1989 was historical, I was real pissed. Because that's <laughs> I'm like, no, no, no. But um, my answer to that is you're going to tell me that's historical, then so is the year 2000. We're just making um, I was I was six in the year two thousand, so that is historical fiction to me. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you for rubbing that in. Um, yeah, uh, it's very. I will say it's very. Um, it's a very good time to be a historical writer because anybody writing the present day right now must be <laughs> must be like extra panicked because like how do you write the present? I mean, you can't. Nope. So right now, everything is speculative fiction. It doesn't it's matter. So but I was, I was having this conversation with a friend recently. The thing about writing the present is that you're actually writing the near future. Because if you're writing a book that takes place now, it will right. come out in a year or two or whatever. Right. And so you're really writing like 2021, 2022. And we just don't know what the world will look like then anymore. So it's, it's a tricky time to be writing. I'm writing a, a contemporary now and I'm making it 2028 because I think I can imagine what that might be. Right. Yeah. I, like that. I, I have a contemporary book that I just turned in and originally it had like dates because it's set within like a 48 hour, like it's a mystery in a 48 hour period. And I was like, nope, the dates are coming off. Like the dates, the times, the year, everything, because I was like, first of all, you don't ever know when it's going to be published in two. I don't want somebody reading it and being like, no, you have to stand six feet apart. Like, did you know, for the main characters, for the romantic couple. So I was like, nope, all the dates, everything are coming off. Because that's the only way you can really do it. I mean, I think at this point. Yep. Well, thank you all so, so much. Um, can we sort of go down the imaginary line since we are all not in the same place and do not have a line um and reiterate your name your book and where people can find you on social media my name is hannah alka um my debut is the weight of our sky and that came out last year in february and i have two upcoming books the middle grade anthology once upon an eid and the middle grade ghost story, The Girl and the Ghost. And you can find me on Twitter and on Instagram at yes, it's Hannah, that's H A N N A, or at hannahalkaf.com. My name is Abdi Nazemian. My novel is Like a Love Story. You can find me on Instagram and Twitter. I'm at abdaddy, um, or you can go to www.abdaddy.com. Uh, my name is Sheree L. Smith, and my newest book is The Blossom and the Firefly. And you can find me online at my website, which is www.sherielsmith.com. I'm on Instagram at rhymes, like, uh, rhymes with Capri, because Sheree rhymes with Capri. And I'm on Twitter at Sheree underline L underscore Smith, which is harder. So just go to Instagram and follow the clicking. <laughs> Kristen, you want to go? You want me to go? <laughs> okay, I'll go. Um, I'm Amy Trueblood, and my latest book, uh, my sophomore book, Across a Broken Shore, uh, came out in uh, November of last year. Um, and then I have a book, my debut um, before that was uh, Nothing But Sky, um, and that came out in 2018. Um, you can find me on Instagram at a true blood Writes. 
On Twitter, I'm uh, at a true blood five, and then all my information is on my website, uh, amytruebloodauthor.com. And thank you, Rachel, very much for putting this together. It was awesome. I'm Kristen Lambert. My book comes out in on May 12th. It's The Boy in the Red Dress. And I'm on Twitter and Instagram at Kristen L. Wrights, K-R-I-S-T-I-N L. Wrights. And my website is KristenLambertWrights.com. Alrighty, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rachel. Thank you. Really. Thank you.